Hello, Lake Springs Church. Hello, Esperanza Church. Hello, Capital C Church. We are here united by one love, one person, the name of Jesus, who unites and does something that no one else can do, unites people from different backgrounds, ethnic origins, even languages, as one people, the people of God. So before we get started today, if you're a middle school student, middle school student, please head out the doors. You're going to have a great time with our leaders. Middle schoolers, please head out the doors. You're going to have a great time. And we're also going to have a great time because we have a mission. The mission that we have given by Jesus to us is to become people of love. So if you're here visiting for the first time, either Lake Springs Church or Esperanza Church, my hope for you is that you find the love of Jesus. That's what we come to experience in the presence of God. That's what we come to experience in the presence of his people. And I want you to live more than with information, with an experience of God's love in your heart and in your mind, seeing what Jesus and only Jesus can do. Now... Before I get started with today's sermon, I need your help. I need your help to determine whether these headlines are true or false. All right, gonna help me out? All right, Disney, first one, Disney buys the exclusive rights to the Bible and plans multiple sequels. How many say true? How many say it's false? Nah, right. All right, second one, let's go to the next one. An Italian province DNA tests dog poo to penalize lazy owners. How many say true? How many say that's gross? Yes, it is. All right, one more last, uh, one last one here. Last Thursday, Google celebrated chilaquiles on all their platforms online. How many say true? How many say false? How many say you're making me hungry? Get, hurry up and, yes. But I ask you to help me identify these uh, statements are true, as true or false because today we're going to ask the age-old question, a question that burns and has always burned in my heart and maybe of many of you here. And that question is, what is truth? ¿Qué es la verdad? What is truth? So today I need you to settle in because we're going to go on a journey. So I need you to just bump the person next to you with your elbow and say, and say tell the truth. And tell, and tell the other person on your left, tell the truth. Tell the person on your right, tell the truth. Now turn back and say, you can't handle the truth. I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, the truth is that we live in a world that is full of lies and deceit and false truths. If you spend enough time in social media, you will see hacks, life hacks that don't work, okay? They're just not true. You will see things and, and news that are slanted one way or the other, polarized by one group of people or another, people that have claimed truth as theirs to, their own, to, the, to benefit their own agendas. And it's no wonder how, why it is so difficult to really discern what is actually true than ever before in human history. Now, when it comes to truth, you have to remember this. Truth doesn't always make sense. It doesn't always make you feel good, but it always brings you freedom. It always brings you freedom. It sets people free. In the world of fake news, we need the good news. The good news that comes from the Word of God. Because the Word of God is full of truth. And we have to pre-decide in our lives, decide ahead, think ahead about what we're going to seek as the most important thing in our lives. And that must be Truth. We must predecide to look for truth because in a kind of world that is full of confusion, 24-7 news cycles, people shouting out things, groups saying this or that, we need to find a firm foundation in the truth of Scripture. We need to predecide to seek truth in Scripture. We need to predecide to find capital T truth in the Word of God. So 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says it this way. Now... We see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God knows, now knows me completely. So if you're tired of lies, if you're tired of all these things that come up against Scripture, we're going to go to Scripture today, to one of the most 
well-known passages of scripture in the book of John, the third gospel in the New Testament, chapter 3. So if you have a Bible, please turn with me to John chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in front of you. And if you uh, prefer, the scriptures will be on screen. But what I love about the biblical principles that we find all throughout scripture that God has given us is that when we start predeciding to walk in those, in those principles, God starts aligning our walk with his and everything begins to lead us to a life of truth, to a life full of the purpose that God has for us. And whether you are a habitual churchgoer or maybe this is your first time after a long time coming to a church, you have probably heard of the most common or well-known verse in all of scripture, which is John 3, 16. In fact, we know it so well that I want us all in your heart language to say it out loud. Okay, we're going to say it. Vamos a decir Juan 3, 16, todos en tu idioma. John 3, 16. Ready? One, two, three. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not sh Vida eterna. Yes. <laughs> this verse is one of the most well-known and most quoted verses in the world. The question is, who was it said to? Because when you hear it, maybe you think, well, it was said to the world. But actually, this was said to one person. And he's not a very famous person in Scripture. In fact, he's only found three times in the book of John. And his name is Nicodemus. Nicodemus. And some scholars believe that the three times he shows up are first in a garden, second in a temple, and third after the crucifixion of Jesus. And what you see in the life of Nicodemus, and we're going to find today together, is that Nicodemus was a person that was committed to truth. He was a truth seeker, and he, was, he had pre-decided, made up his mind, that he was going to find truth no matter what. So, the first time that he meets Jesus, Nicodemus finds Jesus, it's at a garden. So he's heard that the famous, the, the famous Jesus. He's teaching, he's healing, he's doing miracles, he's doing all of these things and sharing the love of God with people. And Nicodemus is not just seeking truth, he needs the truth, he needs to find it. So let's look at the beginning of chapter three. And let's read, I'm gonna read from the New Living Translation from the original Greek. And it says, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. Now let's stop there because it's really important that you recognize that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. In other words, he was a studier of scripture. He was someone committed to study and find the truth in the Hebrew Bible, the law of God. But he was also part of a smaller segment of a group of people of Jewish leaders called the Sanhedrin. And these were the rulers over the Israelites. In fact, this group back in Exodus were, were, were known as men of truth. That's what the Sanhedrin were called, men of truth. So let's keep reading. Nicodemus goes there. And after dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. He came to speak with Jesus at this garden. And what you have to understand here is how scandalous was for Nicodemus to do what he was doing. He was going to meet Jesus in the middle of the night because he didn't want anyone to know that he was meeting with him. Because remember, at that time, the Pharisees, they hated Jesus. They didn't like Jesus. They didn't like what he was doing. They didn't like the authority that he had, the miracles he was performing because it was going against their power. So the Pharisees, they didn't love Jesus. They hated him. So therefore, in this scandalous way, in the middle of the night, Nicodemus goes and meets with Jesus. He gets in the dark to do this scandalous deed. So he goes to Jesus in the dark, and let's keep reading. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Now, he's bothering Jesus up, right? He's saying things that Jesus wants to hear, but Jesus, who knows the profound needs of our hearts, of his heart, he goes straight to his need. He goes straight to what he needs to hear. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. In verse 3, I tell you the truth, Jesus replies. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. 
What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Now, you may have heard this phrase again. You must be born of the Spirit. You must be born again of the Spirit. And Nicodemus, probably one of the first people that ever heard this, and he's confused. He's got all this knowledge, and, and, and yet he doesn't understand. He has spent all his life seeking truth, and yet his view of life with God is clouded. And so he's got all this information, and in verse 9 he asks, how are these things possible? And he's confused because although he has a lot of information, he doesn't have an experience with God. He has a lot of knowledge, but he doesn't have the experience with God. So let's get down to verse 16. After Jesus tells Nicodemus a lot of truths, then we get to where Jesus tells him, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And so Jesus addresses the question behind all the questions. The question Nicodemus was really asking of Jesus and was eager to know is what is the truth? He was wanting to enter into the truth. He was wanting to see if Jesus was indeed the Savior who was sent from God. And there's a huge difference, a big difference between knowing truth and believing the truth. And it has immediate and eternal implications, whether you just know the truth or you actually believe the truth. Because simply knowing something doesn't lead you to live in it. Doesn't lead you to a change in your way and style of living. Believing by experiencing God intimately is what leads you then to transformation. It's not just knowledge. We have heard this from Derek, and I've preached this at Esperanza as well. God, what he wants for us is to yada him, to know him intimately, just as a friend, just as a person who loves us. And if we want to be transformed by truth, with truth, we must experience truth intimately, personally. So we must first seek, then we must find, and then we must finally embrace the truth and begin experiencing the truth so that we may be changed by truth. And not just for our eternity after death, but for our eternity right now, because it's so important that you know this. This is super important. Eternity starts now. Just tell somebody next to you, eternity starts now. La eternidad comienza ahora. That's so important. Eternity starts now, and it's crucial that we understand and hold to this truth at all costs. In that first meeting, Nicodemus started on this journey to find truth. And so together, we're going to look at three truths, three fundamental truths that Nicodemus has to, had to wrestle with, and we must also wrestle with on our way to finding freedom, to experiencing freedom, to experiencing freedom by experiencing the truth. So pre-deciding to seek the truth is what will guard your heart and your mind from the falsehoods and the lies of the world and of the enemy who try to confuse you and get you away from your purpose in Jesus. So there's three truths we must embrace. The first one is the truth about your identity. Your identity matters. And here's the question that I need to ask you today. I need to ask you this. Who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? When you think about your life, not just who you are right now, but who is it that you're becoming? We're all becoming something. Do you like what you're becoming? Do you like who you are becoming? Because what you believe determines what you become. Let me say that again, it's so important. What you believe shapes what you will become. What you believe, in other words, determines your identity. What you believe and hold on to determines your identity, who you become. What you believe currently is determining your identity. So to pre-decide for that truth, you first must discover the truth about who you really are, what God says that you are. And Nicodemus is, is, is on this road. Nicodemus is trying to make sure that Jesus is, say, say, is who he says he is. He's wanting to confirm and Jesus is this awaited Savior. In other words, he wants knowledge. He wants to be sure of the knowledge that he might be induced to think of. But Jesus flips this question on him. 
Jesus looks at him and he sees the real need and shows him the way to discovering and receiving his true identity. And so he tells him, you must be born again. Nicodemus was wrestling with his own identity because up to that point, his identity was based on knowledge, on his studying of scripture, to be able to judge what was true, his ability to tell what is from God and what is not. His identity was based on what people thought of him, on his tradition, on, on his position, on his culture. And he had to hear that Jesus loved him for who he is, not for what he does, not for what position he has. And let me tell you, I've struggled with that all my life. I am a son of a pastor, my dad's right there. And he, uh, you know, told me, you have to be an example to people, and you have to do things, and God wants you to do things, and that's not bad, but that's not our identity, right? Jesus loves us for who we are, not what we do, and then Jesus is guiding Nicodemus into this truth by gently saying, you must be born again into a sonship. You must become a part of the family of God, not do things from a position of authority, but be in communion with the living God as a father to a son. So let's tell the truth today. Let's tell the truth. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? When you looked in the mirror this morning, after you got a little bit more uh, consciousness back in you, what did you see? When you stand there and you look and you evaluate your life, maybe in those quiet moments when there's not a lot of noise around you, what do you see? What do you think of? What's your conversation with yourself? What's the narrative that you're telling yourself? It's funny because men, we look in the mirror sometimes from a profile point, and then we're like, we got to cut down on those chilaquiles, right? <laughs> but maybe some of us look in the mirror and we're the opposite. We don't only like what we see, but we adore what we see. And we say, wow, yeah, I'm, I'm doing it. I got that six pack, I got that energy, I got so many things going for me, right? I have knowledge, I have money, I have a good job, I have power, I have financial security. And we start worshiping that, and we have a pride. And if I'm honest, I've been there too. But you know what? Pride is like a rag around our eyes that blinds us from truth. It's like plugs in our ears that make us immune to the sound of the voice of God. But let me, because let me tell you, God is always speaking. God is always sharing his love. The point is whether we are listening or not. So I pray that you're listening today. But most of us, we look, most of us, we look in the mirror and we see things like shame or guilt. We don't like what we see. Be honest, tell the truth. You're struggling with your identity. Maybe it's something someone did to you. Neglect, violence, abuse when you were little, maybe when you were a teenager, or maybe it's something that you are doing to yourself. Right now even, maybe an addiction, porn, alcohol. Maybe you are doing that to yourself, escapism, even workaholism. Even though you think you're doing great, but you're always doing something, and you're never stopping to just receive the love of God to receive your identity. Or maybe it's like uh, Gen Z's. Any Gen Z's in the house today? So Gen Z's struggle with this. We have to create our own identity. And we have to make it. And it's so anxiety inducing. It's so hard. But the truth is you don't have to find your own identity. You need to receive it from Jesus. He wants to give it to you. He wants to love you right where you are. And all these things, sometimes, with all these thoughts, they lead us to think negative thoughts. Negative thoughts about ourselves. And we want to let go of them, but they don't let go of us. They just hold us, and it's like we're chained to them. Maybe we look in the mirror again, and we say to ourselves, we yell at ourselves. Maybe not in volume, but from the depths of our soul, we're yelling, I don't like what I see. You're a failure. You don't matter. You are disgusting. You're such a hypocrite. If people knew the real you, they wouldn't like you. They wouldn't love you. If God knew what you were doing, he has left you. And the horrible thing is that the more you say these things, guess what happens? You start believing them. And the more you start believing them, you start to become them. And that starts becoming your false identity. So here's the thing. The pathway to freedom is first to bring those things to light, to let God 
know about these things. Even though he knows, you must name them. They lose power when you name them. And also, you must then bring them to someone, someone from the family of God. Maybe it's a parent. If you're a child, if you're a teenager, you know you're doing something that brings you death. Talk to your mom. Talk to your dad. They love you. They want the best for you. Maybe for you, if you're a, an older adult, maybe it's a pastor. Maybe it's an elder. Maybe it's a trusted friend. Maybe it's a family member, someone that loves you and wants to take care of you. You must bring these things to light in order to be healed because God wants to take care of you. But that's only the first step. The second most important step, maybe, is to change what you say to yourself. You must change what you're saying to yourself. you got to do it. Everyone, let's just... Pause for a moment and just hear what I have to say to you because this is the truth. You are not a mistake. Your past doesn't define who you are. You are a child of God. You have been forgiven. You are able to bring your past to God and He will use it for His glory and your good. You are loved by God and you're loved by us. That is why I started by saying, we want you to experience love in this place. Love that surpasses boundaries. And we want you to let God transform you into the person he created you to be. So, if you want to change what you see, who you are, you got to change what you say to yourself. You got to change your identity because your identity must be based on truth. And I'm not talking about your truth. I'm not talking about my truth. I'm talking about the capital T truth that is found in scripture. I'm not talking about manifestations or declaration of saying this or that because let me tell you what. I can say all day, all night that I'm a millionaire and it ain't going to happen. I can look in, the, in, in a pond and look at my reflection and say I'm going to be 6'5 and I'm playing the NBA and it's just not going to happen. Declarations that are not based on the truth of Scripture are just not going to give you life. They're going give to you, leave you empty. And I hear so many celebrities and people saying, oh, I just do declarations and I meditate and I say to myself, those are empty because they're not coming from the truth of Scripture of who God says we are. You have to know this that the declarations that you say to yourself start becoming who you are. So you, we must be saying true things to ourselves. So there's a resource, there's a QR code on the screen that if you uh, grab your phone and you scan it, will take you to a resource called Words to Live By, by Life Church. Words to Live By. Is it there? Uh, no? Well, I, I'll put it in the, in the next email <laughs> that Derek says. I thought I had put it. Oh, yeah, no, I didn't update it. I updated it. Anyways. I'm going crazy. Uh, but if you want to change who you are, if you want to change your identity, you must change what you say. So I'm going to put that resource for you so that you can start making declarations that actually come from the true identity that God has for you. So I'm just going to call it like it is, okay? Some of you look in the mirror and you think you're a loser. Guess what? False truth. You are in Christ more than a conqueror. That's what the scripture says. You might look in the mirror and think you're unlovable. Look, fake truth. Because why? Because God, in God, nothing can separate you from his love. Through Jesus, nothing can separate you from the love of God. And this is the truth that Nicodemus and, and I struggle with. Like, we want to earn lo the love of God. We want to earn it by singing real well, by playing, by serving, by doing things. But we don't have to do it. Because let me tell you this. Maybe this might be shocking, but... You were not created to serve and worship God. First and foremost, you were created, why? To let God love you. God created you so that he could just love you. And it is from that being loved, just like a parent and a child and a baby, it's from that being loved, by receiving that love, that then you're compelled to love back, to adore, to worship, to make that person the object of everything in your life. That's what Jesus is calling Nicodemus to. That's what happens with the flowers, with the rain and the sun. As they receive it, they bloom and they become who God created them to be. And that is the same for you because God created you to be loved. John, 1 John 4.10 says, this is love. Can you say it with me? This is love. God is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That is the truth. We don't do for God so he may love us. We do for God because we 
are in a loving place receiving the love of God. And that's something I am learning. All my life I've been in church. Right now is the first time. I, for those of you who might not know, I'm in a three-month sabbatical from doing for God. And what that's teaching me is that I just must st stay still and receive the love of God. And I've, nev I've never really done that, if I'm honest. And I want you to know God wants that for you. You need to hear this truth. And it's so important that you discover the truth of your identity, that you are a child of God. And you don't do that unless you do it through experience, through an experience of becoming a child of God, through being born again through the Holy Spirit. So, on our way to pre-deciding for truth, first we must wrestle with our identity and find our identity in Christ. And second, we must discover the truth about our community. So let me ask you another question. Where are you belonging? Where are you belonging? Who are your friends? Who do you hang out with? What groups are you in? Because you see, the second time that we find Nicodemus, he does something crazy. He does something insane. He's part of these Jewish rulers that want to kill Jesus, right? That they're plotting to do it. And in John 7, we see that Jesus had been teaching in the temple and the religious leaders were, were planning to arrest him and kill him in the Sanhedrin. And Nicodemus does something crazy. He takes a stand. In chapter 7, verse 50 says, Then Nicodemus, the leader who had met with Jesus earlier, spoke up. Sometimes you just got to get up and speak for truth. And he asks, Is it legal to convict a man before he is given a hearing? Here's what happened. The Sanhedrin, the most powerful religious elite of the time, are planning to kill Jesus. And Nicodemus stands up, stands up for truth. And he brings up this truth. And he starts seeing, as he looks around at his people, as, at, at his community, as the people, at the people who he grew up with, who are supposed to be seeking truth, and he's finding that they are not really interested in truth. What they're interested in is preserving their power, preserving their power. Sometimes, after being exposed to the truth, maybe at a place like this, maybe in an intimate time with God, you look up and you find that around you there are people who are not speaking the truth. In fact, there are people who are standing for things that are way, way far from the truth. People that are toxic, negative, people that are saying things that are far from what God says and are doing and are doing and are not stopping and maybe they're not bad maybe they're just like that em emoji man right <laughs> maybe they're not that bad they're just okay but they're not sharpening you they're not bringing you life they're not bringing you forward in the life that god has for you so tell the truth tell the truth today about your community because maybe you're not really looking for a community in a life group in in a group of 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 work of people of God that want to follow and grow closer to Jesus. Maybe you're finding community in many other places. And they, those things may not, those groups may not be bad, right? They may be doing good things. Things for your children, things for work, things for the community, and that's okay. But those are not the most important people that will bring you closer to Jesus. You must get into a life of community. If you want to find and experience truth, you must do this. Or maybe... And I'm here maybe getting into dangerous territory. But remember, truth challenges us before it sets us free. But maybe you know the truth. And you know the truth of what God says. But the influence of those around you and the sense of wanting to belong keep you quiet. And you don't stop, stand up for truth for fear of consequences. Tell the truth about the groups you're in. Maybe that is that Facebook group that spouts out hate about different groups of people that are not like them. Maybe it's that Instagram person that you're following and is just putting out trash and trash in, trash out. You are just there receiving instead of... And it's, it's time to unfollow them. Maybe it's that relationship that you know you should have broken a long time ago, but you still look at that person and say, there's still potential. Break it out. Break it up right now. Just do it. It's time. Maybe it's time to tell your spouse of that thing you're struggling with. That's keeping you from an intimacy that God created you for. Maybe it's time to go to counseling. Maybe it's time to tell the truth about your community. Because remember what your mom said. Remember what your dad said. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future, right? 
you become who you hang out with. Proverbs says it this way, become wise by walking with the wise. Hang out with fools and watch your life fall to pieces. Tell the truth about your community. You must get around people that love God and walk with you. And if your number one community is not the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, if you're not being with them, if you're not making space in your life to be with them, let me tell you, your life is going to fall to pieces. I can tell you from my own experience. You may know a lot of God, a lot of passages. You may be admired by people by how much you know. But if you are not spending time with the Trinity, with that community that loves you, that wants to embrace you, things are going to get out of whack real quick. If you're not spending time making it a priority to be in a life group, to be with people that love God, to talk about the truth, you're going to easily be an easy prey to the lies of the world because the enemy is like a lion. And what do the lions do to get their prey? They isolate one. Any nature documentary, you'll see this. They isolate one. They go for the one that's alone. You don't need to be alone. Create spaciousness because the way of Jesus begins with what? Being with Jesus. Becoming like Jesus. These things don't come spontaneously or don't come from you listening to Derek or I or Brian talk up here. They don't come from that. They come from you being with God. So discover the truth about your identity. Discover the truth about your community. And finally, let's discover the truth about our eternity. So the question here is, what master are you worshiping? What master are you worshiping? Because here's the truth. We're all worshiping someone. We're all following someone and serving someone. We're all chasing after someone or something. Be honest. Who or what are you following? Are you chasing after money, after fame, after comfort, after popularity? You see, what you chase after defines your master. What you chase after defines your master. That's more, 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 than, like, more than a catchy phrase. It's the truth. You see, the third and final time we see Nicodemus, it's at the cross. Jesus had been beaten to a bloody pulp. A crown of thorns had been played on his head. He's been whipped. He's been spat on. He's been humiliated, hung on a cross. And in one final breath, he gives up his spirit and he dies. And it's over. Scripture tells us that there was a man who asked for the body of Jesus. His name was Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph asks for Jesus' body. And here's the beautiful thing. This is what happens. As he takes the body, let's look at what happens in John chapter 19. Verse 39 says, With Joseph came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfume, perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. These herbs were used to embalm the body of Jesus. The body of people that died were embalmed with these herbs. But some version says that Nicodemus did not just bring 75 pounds. He brought 100 pounds of these herbs to embalm Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but in that moment, that was the wrong time to be aligning with Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was dead. And yet, Nicodemus thought, hey, I'm going to bring my wealth. Because you know what? 75 or 100 pounds of these herbs would cost $250,000 today. And norm, the normal quantity of people being embalmed was about two pounds of herbs. Only royalty got 75 to 100 pounds of herbs. And so Nicodemus is giving Jesus the burial of a king. And he's saying, Jesus is my king. And my allegiance is with this king. He brought everything to Jesus. And he was standing up for the truth that he represented. He found truth. He was looking for truth because he had predecided my life is going to be about truth and I'm going to seek truth at all costs. And so when he meets Jesus for the first time, Nicodemus trying to confirm, are you real, the real Messiah? Are you the one we're waiting for? And then he's just confused. Jesus tells him all these things about being born of the Spirit and he still doesn't get it so he wrestles with his identity. He wrestles with the fact that Following Jesus is more, is more than just knowing things about him. It's about being a son or a daughter, being with his father, with his creator. Then he stands up in front of his peers, and he stands up for truth in his community. And they, he thought that they were following scripture, but then he sees that 
they are not following scripture, they're following tradition. And they are willing to kill for, the, for, for it. And then he stands with Jesus in the crucifixion, and he stands for the truth of his eternity. He had predecided to seek truth at all costs, and it cost him everything. But he found capital T truth. And finally, he found that truth was never a place to arrive. That truth wasn't a thing to possess, but that truth is a person to believe in. Truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. Truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. As Nicodemus found, and he brought everything. He found truth, he brought everything. I can envision him saying something like, for God so loved me that he gave me his one and only son. And because I believe in him, I will not perish, but I will have eternal life starting here and now. And that is the next step for you and I today. It is the same thing. We must embrace truth by deciding, I am going to be born again of the Spirit, no matter where we are. Maybe you are someone who has followed Jesus for a very long time. Maybe you are glad because the walls of this place didn't cave in on you because you're, you feel far from God. Wherever you are, we must realize that truth begins by predeciding to seek truth, to find truth in the person of Jesus and then to embrace it and let him show us the way to uh, an abundant life and rest for our souls. The devil thought he had won. Jesus was dead. But guess what? Fake truth. False truth. Because three days later, the tomb was empty. There was no body in the grave. Jesus was alive. And today, that remains the truth. So I want to leave you with this today. John 8, 32 says this. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So I'm inviting you today. I don't know if you've been a thousand years. Yes, praise God. I don't know if you've been your whole life like me in church. Or this is your first time and you're seeking. I, I want to invite you to come into the presence of truth. And to find truth and be set free. So close your eyes for a moment with me. I'm just going to pray. We're going to pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your truth displayed in the person of Jesus. Thank you for your son. Father, I thank you for the freedom that comes through him. I believe, God, that there are many people in this place that are going to maybe start or maybe continue their journey towards you, towards truth. And God, I pray that today, that today you speak in a way that is so beautiful that brings us all into relationship, into a deeper and deeper relationship with, with you. So maybe as you're listening with your eyes closed, with your eyes closed, maybe the truth that you will predecide today is, has to do with your identity. Maybe you've been believing things that are not true about yourself. You need to start declaring truths about your life. You need to start Declaring the truth that scripture says of, about who you are. You, change, you need to change the narrative in your head. Or perhaps it's about community. The truth is that you're walking with people that are bringing you down, that are bringing you death, not life. Whatever the case may be, today I want you to choose to predecide to seek truth at all costs, to seek the presence of Jesus. And if you want to seek the truth, just tell God right now, I want to seek you. I realize where I am is not where you want me to be. I want to go on that journey. I want to experience truth by experiencing you. God, I pray right now as we take steps towards you today, God. Could you just say this with me to God? Just say, Lord, I commit. I pre-decide to seek truth. I predecide to be with Jesus. God, would we, be, would we be able to find that identity in you? Would we be able to be bold, to be brave, to declare you as our king? As we continue in that attitude of prayer, maybe there are some of you here today that you find yourself relating to Nicodemus. You're doing all these things for God, but you haven't stopped for a moment in your everyday life, in your day-to-day, -to, -day, to just receive the love of God. 
Maybe you grow up and you know a lot of things. But when you look around you, there are a lot of religious people that just say things and just spew out hateful rhetoric about others. And you need to stand up for truth. And you need to go into a place where there's community that loves God and loves people. Today, maybe you need to be born again. Maybe you need to say, I need this truth in my life. I need Jesus in my life. And I'm not talking about joining a religion. Please don't join a, a religion. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about joining a relationship with God through being a son or a daughter of the Most High. And here's what I want you to know. Just as Nicodemus came to Jesus and Jesus met him right where he was, God wants to meet you right where you are. You don't have to get better. You don't have to do good things. You can just come as you are. And I believe that there are those of you who want to do that. So I want to give you that opportunity this morning. Jesus is the Son of God who came to show us the life that God always meant for us to live and then died the death that we deserve because we did not and could not and cannot live that life. And He paid the price for our sin in, on the cross and He paid the debt once and forever and then three days later he rose again to show his power of resurrection and restoration so i pray that today is the day that you decide to become a son or a daughter of jesus so if you want to do that today just with your eyes closed your eyes closed say this with me god i recognize i'm a sinner i recognize my need for you God, I confess you as the Lord and the Savior of my life. And I want to follow you all of my days. And if you made that prayer today, I want to invite you to go into the back as we sing this next song. Because we're going to sing about our freedom. We're going to sing about our adoption into the family of God. And as we sing this together, I want you to go into the back and let us pray for you, with you, and help you on this journey. And if you're already a son of God, please embrace the truth about your identity, your community, and about your eternity that starts right here, right now, as a son and a daughter of Jesus today.